Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks again for joining uh, for another uh, week of Water Talks here. Uh, we're very happy to have some guest speakers with us today. Uh, Brian Dara from Detroit, uh, City of Detroit Water and Sewage Department and Jim O'Dowd uh, from AECOM. So happy to uh, have you both with us and be getting into some of your work uh, here today. All right, this is for your host today. My name is Tim Adiris. I've been uh, hosting these water talks on and off for the last couple of years now, but I am a solutions engineer here at Innovise. Uh, but for most of the presentation today, again, you'll be uh, hearing from uh, Jim uh, and uh, Brian. Thanks again for joining. Uh, if you would both like to introduce yourselves, that'd be great. Hey, Brian Dara, DWSD Engineering. Uh, Jim O'Dowd from AECOM Engineer. Perfect, thank you both. Um, for today's um, Water Talks, again, if you have any questions, please do submit those in the GoToWebinar panel there. Uh, we will be kind of focusing on those. Uh, Jim and Brian have a lot of content, a lot of great stuff to get to in terms of the um, their whole CIP journey they've been working on together, uh, but we will try to uh, get to those questions. Uh, this will, in fact, actually be the last presentation, GoToWebinar, uh, excuse me, last Water Talks we'll be doing in the GoToWebinar platform. You'll see in kind of the, the schedule coming up for future uh, Water Talks, we've got a bit of a break, and we'll be switching to, uh, as we kind of do this merge with Autodesk, uh, we'll be switching to the Zoom platform, and so we'll need a few weeks to kind of get everything in line for that. Uh, and you'll see uh, in April 19th, we'll be looking at um, water quality modeling within uh, InfoWater Pro, and we'll have a guest speaker as well for that one. And then later in May, we'll be looking into some of the basics in InfoWorks ICM there. Uh, and again, if, if you are out there and you have a water story you'd like to tell, uh, please do let us know. Happy to kind of post you uh, on our Water Talks kind of platform here. All right, and with that, a lot of good stuff Brian and Jim have to get to, so I will change presenter here over to you, Brian, and let you go from there. All right, you should have control now. Let's see which screen is being shared. Uh, I see agenda right now. Okay, great. Uh, also, I, I'm not seeing the presenter mode. I'm seeing the, the slides and uh, everything in PowerPoint. So, okay. Show screen. How about now? Perfect. Yep. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Very good. Um, well, thanks very much there, Tim, for the introduction. Hope you guys can hear me okay. Um, so uh, next slide there, please, uh, Brian. Okay, so this is the agenda for today. Um, I'm going to talk about the system background overall process and goals. And then I'll hand it over to Brian. He's going to talk about risk and criticality. And you'll be able to tell Brian and I apart because Brian's the one with the funny accent. So condition assessment and CIP development, I'll be taking that on. And then Brian's going to bring it home with uh, hydraulic models and training in transition. Next slide, please. Okay. And I broke it. It's not one reason. It should be good. Yep, yep, sure. Yeah, next slide. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so this is the background overall uh, goals. Right, so the background information on, on this. Um, so ACOM became involved in the Sitmo program back in 2017. Up to that point, the city of Detroit had been, uh, you know, mainly doing upgrading about uh, half a percent of their infrastructure per year. The average uh, water and sewer pipe age is about 100 years. And DWC planned about $400 million of infrastructure investment over five years. So there's a critical 
for uh, renewing the infrastructure in the city. You can be seen in that image of the spaghetti of uh, various pipes in the system. Next slide, please. So on the water side, they've got over 2,700 miles of infrastructure and 15% of it has been replaced since the original installation in the mid 1800s. In fact, the, the earliest pipe was installed in 1838. Um, there's about 1,500 pipe breaks per year. And there's, there's a lot of these pipes are you know, cast iron with uh, severe tuberculation. So there's reduced pressure and fire flow in the system. Next slide, please. So the, the water pipe vintages, um, there was a, mainly due to the automotive industry and the boom there. Um, from the, but the middle of World War One to about 1928-29, that, that those were the that was the heyday of uh, installation of pipe uh, for water pipe in Detroit, and then after that it dropped off uh, quite a bit. So, but up to 1921, it was mainly uh, uh, pit cast um, uh, cast iron that was installed, and then after 22, it was the spun cast thinner wall stuff. Next slide, please. On the sewer side, there's about 3,000 miles. It is a combined system, so the, those pipes are much, much bigger than what you would see in a sanitary system. There's about 200 sinkholes or cavens per year. Uh, over a billion dollars has been spent on combined sewer overflows since 1994. And lining was the primary uh, method of, uh, of uh, rehabilitation in the previous 20 years to sit on starting. Next slide, please. So uh, in 2017, the Capital Improvement Program Management Organization, or CIPMO, was created. And the goals there were to develop and manage this $400 million CIP program, to develop and train uh, the staff within DWSD, bring economic value to the city in terms of system efficiencies, and fully integrate with all the other activities going on in the city for infrastructure, master planning, um, land use, uh, also, we wanted to ensure connectivity with other legacy DWC systems like GIS and, uh, and now CityWorks. So, a team uh, led by AECOM that included DLZ and uh, Metco and, and uh, Van Dyck and Horn um, that were embedded in with the DWC team in Detroit. And we have various uh, groups with management, planning, modeling, inspection services, design, public relations, quality control, just to name a few. Next slide, please. So asset management is the foundation of SIPMO. So there, there on the left there, you're seeing the, 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 the 10-step process from EPA, which is you know the inventory of assets, assess the condition, assigning risk, coming up with the best uh, O&M and capital improvement strategies. And uh, on the right there, and, and what we're seeing there is where we're, where we're aligning the activities across the organization based on the goals there in the center. Okay, so next slide, please. So uh, the program assessment, all that work is consistent with those DWSD goals. So for source system improvements, we're talking about reducing the sinkholes or cavens, reducing uh, the untreated CSOs, INI, meeting flow and capacity requirements and reducing risk. And on the water side, we want to reduce non-revenue water and uh, ac accordingly reduce uh, main breaks and flooding, improve levels of service, you know, pressure and uh, fire flow and reduce risk. Next slide, please. So where to start? So we did have a pilot program at the start, and uh, you know we, we, one needs to identify uh, what the scope of work is, what individual tasks are involved, what teams one would need, what condition assessment data will be required, do there's technical specifications in place, do those need to be updated, and uh, what standard operating procedures are in place also. Next slide, please. So this might look a little small, but uh, I want to show you the, the breadth of the uh, length of these projects. So starting on the top left, where the, the, the project is initially, you know, we, we, where the risk and criticality work is done to identify what assets and, and uh, neighborhoods are to be investigated, all the way down to the far right, where the, the construction, the resultant construction from all that work is finished. That's about a four year uh, time period. So now I don't expect you guys to read all this, but you know we, this is essentially looking at the progress and the uh, uh, the relationships between the various tasks occurring from doing the risk and criticality, sending the contracts out for procurement to get a contractor to do the condition assessment. So there, that big line in blue in the middle, where that, that's where the contractor is doing the condition assessment in the field, 
that work comes into the office where we do our condition assessment uh, evaluation, CIP evaluation, pass data to the modelers. The modelers then work with the designers to come up with uh, what interventions uh, find, need, need to be on the final set of plans. Final set of plans are developed, construction is uh, procured, and the contractor starts with that last uh, blue line uh, there at the bottom, and they'll work for about two years. So it's a lot of, lot of things involved, lots of dependencies here. And next slide, please. So in terms of software, right, that's why a lot of you guys are here. So what software is available to help with this work, right? We need to identify that. Does DWC have the right software and available trained staff who can use it? Is the software capable of handling different conditions and scenarios required by DWSD? Okay. And another really big one is, is the software supported and does it have a roadmap for future development by the vendor? Because that, that, that's really essential. It does have a future, right? And can the software be used with other software applications currently in use at DWSD? Next slide, please, Brian. So look, going back to that calendar we just looked at, what tools are we using? So we're using InfoAsset Planner for the risk and criticality work. We're using InfoAsset Manager for the condition assessment work and CIP determination. Um, we're using uh, InfoWorks ICM for sewer modeling, and Brian will be talking about that soon. And InfoWater Pro for water modeling. And soon, here in the next uh, month, we will be um, deploying InfoAsset online so that the data can be viewed online too. And with that, Brian, I think I'm over to you. Next slide. Okay. So, like, uh, like Jim just mentioned, uh, our risk and criticality model is built in the Info Asset Planner software. You guys still see it? Great. Um, and so every, every year our risk and criticality model is re-ran. Um, and this ensures that we always have a, uh, an accurate uh, re-ranking of the neighborhoods uh, so that we can plan our, you know, the, the next set of condition assessment contracts and put those out, which would then in turn eventually become uh, capital improvement projects and be fed back into the data sources that we use to feed the risk and criticality model. Um, throughout the year, we, uh, we coordinate with the different managers uh, that, that maintain these databases um, and make sure that their information is being collected in the way that we need it and it can be easily digested by the uh, InfoAsset uh, planner software. Um, and every at the end of every year, we rerun the model um, and update our uh, update our outputs. So it, it's a cyclical process. Um, it, it it's reran every single year, and it helps keep the uh, CIP program on track um, with uh, with, with uh, the the best look ahead that we can have uh, with the data we have. So this is the fifth version of the risk and criticality model we're in right now. So it, it's already gone through a couple iterations of, uh, you know, adjusting the criteria that we feed it and, you know, the different weighting scales that we give this criteria, you know, completely removing and adding certain data sets. So it, it's a pretty mature model and it's referencing pretty mature data sets, um, data sets maintained by the city of Detroit and our GIS system external uh, groups like SEMCOG, GLIWA, and MDOT, um, as well as our hydraulic models, the water model and the sewer model. All of this, uh, the, this modeled simulated data is uh, very important to the risk and criticality model, as well as uh, any of the work order system managed in CityWorks. So th th this is uh, pr pretty much to calculate risk, you, you need to first determine the, the level of service that your, your, your goal is on, on the assets that you're, you're maintaining, right? So, um, you know, risk is simply just the multiplication of the probability of failure and the consequence of failure. And all of these different criteria that you have data on rolls up into determining what your probability of failure and your consequence of failure is. Um, this is, uh, you know, so some of the consequence of failure impacts we have, you know, they, they're categorized into like, you know, economic, social, operational, environmental implications. And 
pr pretty much like e economic would be, um, you know, any direct or indirect capital costs that would result from the failure of an asset. Uh, social is, you know, impact to the public uh, from the failure of an asset. Operational would be pr pretty much our ability to circumvent the asset in the event of a failure or possibly like the complexity of resolving the issue um, if, if an asset was to fail. Um, and environmental being any potential impacts to the environment if, if the asset was to fail. Um, probability of failure is uh, similar in that, but it's, uh, it's more, um, it, it, it's speaking a little bit more to the asset. So it, it's gonna be uh, structural failures would be like material degradation over time or its ability to resist applied load uh, by the system or any of the hydraulic uh, losses that 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 we can simulate with the models, roughness factors, available fire flow measurements, uh, you know, from from both the field condition assessment and the model, um, and water quality issues. This is going to be density of lead service connections, um, you know, all the way up to water age uh, uh, that that we would get from the extended state, um, the extended simulation water models. So th this is the framework that we uh, we we have our um, that 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 we use to determine risk in our water model. It's uh, I mean, if if the risk if the water risk model was one thing, it would be this image, and it, it's essentially uh, extremely uh, replicable and defensible in how risk is calculated, right? We, we have uh, risk is the multiplication of pro uh, probability of failure and consequence of failure. And each of these are broken out in an extremely easy to understand um, or easy to track uh, um, numbers, right? So, you know, you can see how the data, how that data is boiling down into being factored into any of the probabilities and risk, right? The, uh, the, the sewer model, uh, very similar in its consequence of failures, but it's actually using uh, different uh, criteria uh, to determine its impact. Um, and same with uh, the probability of failure. It, it's extremely similar in nature. The, the structural failures is coming from material degradation, but it's it's different in the fact that uh, sewer, you have the benefit of having a direct observation of the asset, right? You can put a camera through it and you're gonna get PACP coding. So we're still evaluating it from a structural failure standpoint, um, but we have different means of doing that. So we're gonna have different data sets to do that with. Um, and then hydraulically speaking, you know, you're, you're going to, you know, instead of monitoring deficiencies in available fire flow, you might be modeling loss of conveyance or high HGLs or, or, or something along those lines. So same, same as before, uh, th th this, this framework outlines an extremely replicable, uh, defensible framework of calculating risk on all of these sewer assets. So the, the we how how do we turn this into like an actual project that we can actually move forward with, right? You know, we have all of this risk assigned on individual pipes, right? So what we do is we aggregate this risk up to the neighborhood level, and it allows us to systematically address regions of Detroit with the greatest risk. Um, and then there there's there's factors outside of the risk model um, that haven't been, um, you know boiled into the framework exactly, such as, uh, you know, SNF uh, areas, um, DPW projects. The, these, these are subsections of um, the, the system that we can kind of look at after the risk and criticality model is updated and determine, okay, what, what kind of information uh, that can we take out of this and act on outside of the traditional CIP process? And this is an example of how, um, you know, the, the, the risk is the accumulation of the, the probability of failure and the consequence of failure, right? If something has a high consequence of failure, but a very low probability of failure, 
Um, it might not be the most uh, demanding asset for, for an intervention, right? So, so we, we need to consider the, the two. Um, and you can see, you know, uh, downtown area. That this kind of showing you downtown has a high consequence of failure. That, that's, um, you know, and through the framework, you could see like why that might be, right? It's going to be a high high density. Um, the the you know the road types there. It's going to increase the consequence of failure. But at the same time, when you factor in the probability of failure, you know things look a little different. And the, this shows you how the individual assets uh, risk aggregate up into the neighborhood level. And, you know, we, we, uh, we pretty much get the, um, the neighborhood ranking from, from this system, right? We're, we're able to rank our neighborhoods, have a uh, accurate, um, updated top 25 neighborhood list that we can, you know, plan accordingly. Um, and uh, look, you know, down the road, where might we be three years from the future? you know, three years into this program. Um, and, you know, it, it might tweak a little from version to version, but as the model matures, it, it switches a little bit less, right? Same thing with sewer system. Um, this is how um, the, the neighborhoods are ranked um, based on the, uh, you know, the, the, the risk tied to the assets that are inside of these neighborhoods. Again, the, the, the risk is tied to the asset and not the neighborhood. Perfect. Jim? Perfect. Thanks, Brian. Um, before we go to Jim, uh, just one question for you as we trans kind of transition here. Uh, Brian, how did you, uh, or maybe Jim too, how, did, how do you associate those junction results you kind of mentioned, uh, pressure and, and average fire flow from those hydrants, maybe those were junction results with specific pipe segments uh, for your asset management ranking and CIP and, and that risk analysis? Was there a yeah, yeah. So the 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 risk model is uh, running the risk on the pipes, right? And and you 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 probably have a modeling background to understand. Hey, a pipe doesn't have an available fire flow. A node does, right? Um, and all, same with pressure, right? Pre pressures would be assigned to a junction or a node in, in a model network, not a pipe. W what what we 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 did was look at. Um, I mean, we pretty much just assigned you know, the, the, the weakest of the fire flows to the, the, the pipe it's on, or, you know, the, 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 if we're not meeting fire flow requirements on a junction adjacent to a pipe, we would, we would assign that to that pipe. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of how that was addressed um, in, in, in these models. Jim, do you have anything to add to that? No, no, Brian nailed us. Yep. Great. Okay, so I'll uh, right over to Jim. He'll uh, explain the condition assessment and CIP development process. Okay. Thanks very much, Brian. Okay. Uh, next slide there, please. Okay. So I'm going to start with water CIP development. This is sort of our little schematic of all the activities boiled into one. Um, so inspection activities include leak detection, valve exercising, uh, C-factor testing, and hydrant testing. So that work is sent out to a contractor. The contractor performs the work. The data, the data comes in from the field. We do QAQC on it. So then the water monitors take the C factor information and the hydrant tests, and then they calibrate the water model based on that. Um, meanwhile, any leaks that are, are found are then sent to DWSD's maintenance and repair group. They in turn uh, will go out and you know, dig down, see is, is there actually a, a leak there, if it is a true break they will uh, record it in their city work system. And then all, all this happens over about, you know, depending on the length of the contract, you know, five or six months. And uh, Finally, we have a calibrated water model and we, we have all this break data. All that information gets imported into Infoasset Manager. And uh, we then look at the, uh, the condition of the pipe, look at the, look at the available fire flow and the interventions. And then we review those interventions holistically. There's a bit of back and forth between design, you know, where maybe we want to uh, upsize some pipes. Um, and, you know, how, how would that affect the, the system hydraulically? That goes back to the modelers. They let us know and it proceeds from, from there. Next slide, please.
Okay, so we captured the data um, in the past contracts. We've captured the data in Esri Collector app. Moving forward, we're going to be doing all that work in CityWorks. Next slide, please. So leak detection, what are we talking about there? We're just, you know, attaching sensors to you know, valves and hydrants and uh, listening for uh, for uh, leaks uh, through the, the noise. And that gets pinpointed by the contractor and then gets sent over to the maintenance and repair group. Next slide, please. Valve exercising, pretty basic stuff here, right? We're just checking to see, does the valve actually work? Is it functional or is it uh, broken? Uh, is the operating not functional, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and of, often we find, you know, that, uh, you know, or not often, but sometimes we find that some, some valves that we thought were supposed to be open are in fact closed. Some are broken open, broken closed, lots of different things that uh, that work uh, reveals. Next slide, please. Hydrant testing, another important uh, part, that little uh, the red uh, hydrant there in the middle is the flow hydrant, and on either side then we have two residual hydrants, and they will go and flow those and uh, get the results and uh, import that information into the water model. Next slide, please. bit more complicated than that um, is uh, C-factor testing. So uh, at the bottom there, we see there's a larger red hydrant. That's the flow hydrant. And there's three hydrants going up um, on the line there to towards the northwest. And those would be the residual hydrants. We isolate that, that, that line, close valves, blow that, that flow hydrant. And uh, from the resultant uh, pressure data, flow data, we can then calculate the C factors and again, incorporate that into the hydraulic model. Next slide, please. So modelers do their thing and Brian will be talking about that a little later. So they can identify areas with low pressures and next slide, please. And areas with insufficient available fire flow. So that would be where it's less than the ISO needed fire flow or if it's less than 750 gallons per minute. Next slide, please. So what are we actually doing with all the data? So there's, you know, there's four interventions really to improve fire flow capacity. So we've got pipe replacement, number one. Now, bear in mind, you know, these, these pipes in, in Detroit, a lot of them installed, you know, in the you know, late 1900s, um, up to 1928, a lot of tuberculation in these pipes, you know, they weren't lined. So we see, we say that, see that quite a bit. Um, pipe upsizing is another option to improve fire flow. Pipe lining is uh, we can to improve the C factor, and also we can improve the network connectivity by by connecting dead end pipes to form a loop. So the hydraulic model is used to determine the most uh, appropriate approach there. But if the if the pipes have no major struck or not no major hydraulic issue, but they might have structural uh, issues where they've had you know five breaks uh, per thousand feet, um, those will also be identified for repair. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, what we do then in Infoacid Manager, and that's what we're looking at right here, on that pipe there on the far right, it's a the blue pipe where all that stuff just popped up. Uh, that's 1924 spun cast iron a pipe with a C factor of 30 from the recent um, testing. And what we we, could, we then bring in the, those uh, the uh, the break incidents. From, um, from CityWorks, those are those little purple things. We can see the date there that those occurred. And also those green symbols that are popping up, those are the actual leaks that were identified in the recent project by the contractor. And those pop up. So we can, again, bring all this information together in one place as a clearinghouse and manager. Next slide, please. So it's a pretty simple process, really. Um, you know, we've got all the information together and you know, when, when we want to prioritize, Pipes with the greatest number of breaks will, would be uh, eligible uh, candidates uh, over ones that maybe only have like one or two breaks per thousand feet. Other ones have maybe seven or eight. It's pretty clear to prioritize. We, we will uh, identify those pipes. Next slide, please. And all we do is something that's pretty simple, really. We just uh, draw in pipes that we call potential pipes in InfoAsset Manager. Those are those cyan ones there. And um, those are just very schematic, and those are what would go to design to start their work. And they obviously pinpoint 
the, the, the work uh, to the valve um, and establish the, 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 the true scope of the project. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is an example of a deliverable uh, GIS map that we give design, um, indicating the different repair types. Next slide, please. We'd also give them a table indicating the location, diameter, um, you know, length, all that stuff. Next slide, please. And you know, zooming in on, on that, you know, we, we can see the specific interventions that are recommended from replacement, to structural lining to upsizing and the, and the reasons for saying. Next slide, please. Okay, so the, on the sort side, you know, it's a similar process, but with very different information. So the inspection activities would be, it's mainly CCTV um, inspections and manhole inspections. We also have laser and sonar inspections and GPS work. Uh, that is performed in the system. So the contractor goes out there, does their work, takes them about a year on average, we give them a year to do it. We process the data, we do QAQC on the data, we, we import everything into Manager and review it there. Um, if it's acceptable, we will update the assets in Infoasset in Manager. So um, say there was a, you know, originally that we thought that the pipe was a a 21 inch brick pipe and when they do the inspection they find out it's actually a 24 inch vcp pipe but then i'll update that information in manager and any of the geometric information on that too of inverts and you know depth 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 to invert that kind of stuff so we also then run condition assessment queries on the data i'll talk about that in a little bit longer it assigns repair worthy defects uh we assign repair worthy worthy, de worthy defects uh, from queries as well and then we review the interventions, make a recommendations, and then we also pass this asset information over to the modelers. Now, we're using, I mentioned before, we're using InfoAsset Manager for all this data. Um, the modelers are using Infoworks ICM. They share a database, and this is absolutely crucial. We can bring in the InfoAsset Manager database in the background in ICM and build the model directly from it. It's one of the great selling points uh, uh, for the software, one of the reasons that we recommended it initially years ago. Um, so the modelers will then, they, they will have had uh, flow meters in the system and in, in these areas, in these neighborhoods, they will then calibrate their model based on that data with the updated asset information. And then we review the data holistically. Again, they'll produce their results under the, the I think it's the 10 year storm. And we will then see where we have capacity issues. We may you know, upsize those pipes perhaps. And uh, also, again, this back and forth with design on what interventions finally will be selected. Next slide, please. So if you look at the, the various data uh, capture uh, things that we're doing. So on the left there, we're seeing a, uh, a panoramic inspection of a manhole. And on the right there, we're seeing standard CCTV inspections. And we're, we're insisting in the specifications that all of that is done to NASCO standards. Next slide, please. So the import process and manager then, it's pretty simple. Uh, we're just going in and importing the data here. I'm, I'm importing this uh, PACP data. We'll go and grab the uh, MDB file, import it. It'll do its thing, a couple of seconds. And you can see all those areas there in, the, in green uh, by the way, uh, those are all the pipes, but the stuff in the background was the um, all the inspections. Once it's in there, we just open up Manager um, and you know click on the click on the defects, and we can see exactly what's going on in the system right there at our fingertips. Pretty good system. Next slide, please. So we we do have a sewer intervention. Um, now we don't go through this for every single CCTV inspection. Um, we, what we do is uh, we click on the next slide here. Oh, next slide there. Uh, thank you, sir. Okay. Um, so we 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 simplified it in, in InfoAsset Manager. We set these repair-worthy defects on the CCTV user fields in Manager. So, for instance, if there there were six fractures um, coded that we would throw that into, into a user number field. Uh, then we just set interventions based on those defect quantities. So for instance, if there's more than four fractures on the pipe, we will then recommend that for, for lining perhaps. So then 
break out those intervention and query results. We review each CCTV survey because all this stuff is just a hint. You still need to use engineering judgment on this and review the, you know, re review the video. And we create those pipe repairs treatments. And we can typically process around 2,000 linear feet per hour. Next slide, please. So here we can see the, the profile of the pipe. We can see the in, in manager. We can see the, in, the, um, the CCTV defects. And you can just click on those and, and go directly to that survey at that location. Next slide, please. And here again, we're just you know, we're reviewing each CCTV survey that is indicating an issue from those queries. We're taking a look at it ourselves. Next slide, please. And we also, in our, in our standard operating procedures, we created a PowerPoint that has images of repair-worthy defects. So in this instance, we're, it's, and it's a reference point for the reviewers, right? So if you see an issue like this with broken or overlized uh, deformed pipe, you know, we'd recommend that for external point repair or replacement, definitely not lining. Okay, next slide, please. Similarly, um, for brick sewer here, we you know, uh, roots in a, in a 36 inch egg shaped sewer. Next slide, please. And here we have a pipe that's actually lined in, in the past, but you can see roots coming in at the connection. So that, that might be a candidate for recurring cleaning or um, or chemical root control. Next slide, please. So when we, I mentioned earlier about looking at things holistically. So if you see there on the left, we've got a number of pipes uh, that where, where they have green suggested repairs and they're, they're all proposed to be lined. And then in the middle, then you've got two red pipes that might, might have a trenchless point repair recommended or maybe nothing recommended. But for economies of scale, what we actually do is we line all the way through that section. It's the same vintage of pipe, it's the same material, same age. You may as well just go ahead and do it and get it taken care of. Next slide, please. So deliverable components for the design group, we'll give them GIS maps, the water side, you know, tables with proposed repairs, and some individual repair reports. Next slide, please. So this is an example of a map with structural repairs. Next slide, please. And we have tables uh, where, we've, where we've created the repairs directly in Manager. And we've also assigned the number of defects on those two so that <clears throat> both mine and even the contractors down the road can see what they're getting into. They can see like the number of fractures, the uh, number of obstructions they might be encountering. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the resultant reports from Manager. They can be just you know, automatically generated. We do these uh, mainly for external point repairs and trenches point repairs. Uh, to indicate, show them the issue that they'll, they'll be encountering. Next slide, please. And now coming soon, InfoAsset Online, Brian and I have been working on this for the last few weeks. And uh, what you can do in online is everything that's in Manager will be in online, so including all the assets, inspections, all that stuff. So what, I, what I'm doing here, and this will repeat through here in a second, is you can actually look at the profile of a pipe. You can see where the defects are along the pipe. So that's what I'm doing here. I clicked on the pipe, click on, on the um, long section. It'll show it, show the defects. You then watch the CCTV survey directly using any web browser. So you can click on it here. It'll take you right to what those defects are. And you can make that full screen too. Okay. Next slide, please. I think that's it. Over to you, Brian. Okay. Yeah, so... Uh the uh, DWSD hydraulic model is built in InfoWater Pro now, um, now that it's compatible with GIS Pro. Um, so to understand how we built our water model, you need to understand that the, the DWSD system bifurcated in 2015, there's now a Great Lakes Water Authority and a DWSD system, right? Uh, DWSD maintains and operates the local distribution and collection mains within the city of Detroit, whereas the Great Lakes Water Authority, they maintain and operate um, the transmission, the regional transmission and regional collection system, including the wastewater treatment plant, the water treatment plants, um, and any of the pump stations and facilities throughout the system. So, uh, but, but there's really no way to separate the two. They're, 
too interconnected. So as a DWSD modeler, I am still building the model, um, including the regional systems. So we have a uh, uh, we have a very structured approach to uh, updating our model, um, and it's uh, it, we 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 do this regularly, um, and it, it's pretty well documented. So we we uh, need to every year we update the network, which is taking in all the the latest and greatest GIS updates that have been made throughout the year. We bring in our new demands uh, that that that's you know, pretty, pretty much the consumption throughout the system, including the uh, suburban customers, um, and br bring that into the model, reestablish your profiles, we macro calibrate it, and then we add the micro calibration on top of all this, which is pretty much the result um, of the condition assessment data that we're doing. And then output our results to, uh, to, to make it useful to the designers and the risk and criticality model, because ultimately these results are made available there. So the the, the network, like, like I said, we, we bifurcated from the Great Lakes Water Authority, and now um, the, the, there needs to be a high level of coordination with their GIS team and ours to maintain these connections, right? Because it's still one system. It needs to be represented as a single con continuous system. All of these interconnect points need to be maintained. And when um, you're, you're making updates to one uh, GIS database or another, the, these, these connections need to be maintained. Um, as well as any uh, corrections that uh, the modeling team notices that needs to be made, we need to, we, we need to communicate that to the DWSD GIS team uh, to, to make sure that, you know, that, that that's the one source of truth, right? Instead of, uh, you, you shouldn't be making corrections in the model because that's not going to go anywhere. It needs to roll up to the GIS so it can uh, go, go out to everyone that, you know, need, needs that uh, correct representation. So uh, after you rebuild your network model, um, you need to uh, distribute the demands across the system, right? So there, these uh, consumptions or, or demands, pretty much water leaving the model, is uh, the, this data stored in a couple different formats, right? There, there's the WAMR um, meters, the wholesale automatic meter readers. This is all of our suburban customers that are um, uh, master metered will have, you know, WAMR data. The, uh, and, and then we have uh, the city of Detroit has AMR data, um, which are the automatic readers, and um, then just billing records, which gives us a daily consumption. Um, and then there's other losses in the system that would be leakage, meter inaccuracies, et cetera, right? So we, we, we get those magnitude, we get the magnitudes, we establish the patterns. Now we have to allocate that to uh, the model, right? Uh, allocate these demands to the model. Um, now we don't have a junction at every single consumption point. Um, that's, that's, uh, that would be too many junctions and it wouldn't really serve any, any purpose, right? So our pipes are resegmented at fittings, hydrant leads, and valves, and that's where we have junctions. So we use a tool in InfoWater Pro, uh, the demand allocator, um, to uh, intelligently assign um, uh, intelligently assign these demands to junctions based on you know location, proximity, and then you know. Um, a little bit more logic built in the back end of that just to make sure that you're not, um, you know, uh, screwing it up. So after you have the demands pattern set and applied, uh, you're you're ready for the brains of the model, right? This is the uh, the SCADA data. This the, this will include the, uh, the the system pressure monitoring points, any of the pump statuses, valve statuses, um, you know, that what what your pumpages were at at your water treatment plants. All of this data, um, you know, is it, fed into the model. It, it, it's ran, and then you know, you you, you look for, hey, where's where it not matching up? And then you you kind of st study why that might be and make make the appropriate connections. Um, this macro calibration is completed for three days. Um, the the average day, min day, maximum day. Uh, th this is done for you know different scenarios might require a different um, demand uh, requirement, right? So if you're running a 
water age model, you want to be using a min day model, right? Because um, it'll give you the worst case scenario. You're going to get older water in your system running the min model. Max day model and, uh, you know, it's steady state version component or the peak hour component of the max day model. That'll help you with capacity analysis, right? So th this is why we, you know, build out three models. Um, now, micro calibration. This is why we condition assess our assets. The, the C factor test, well, not the only reason, but the C factor test and hydrant flow testing, um, they, they are ultimately our use at this stage um, to uh, calibrate the model in, in that local area, right? The C factor test directly provides you the, the, the roughness factors of the pipes they're applied on, right? And then when you uh, re update your model with your hydrant uh, scenarios, you're able to see how the, you're, you're able to run the model, see how it um, thinks the system would react, and then you get to confirm with, with the field data that you've recovered hey, that says, uh, you know, hey, how close is it? And are there adjustments to other roughness factors that you need to make? And all these roughness factors are part of roughness groups, and it all rolls up into the general microcalibration of the model. So now that you have a microcalibrated model, uh, you can start having a lot of fun with it, um, or at least I think so. Um, but th th this is with, with the calibrated model, th th this is where you can run it and get your, you know, uh, measure the head loss throughout your system, um, any of the pressures in your system, which th this this figure is um, showing, uh, you know, pressure gradients throughout, throughout the system. Um, the available fire flow uh, simulated results uh, and water quality, which is, you know, water age um, in the system that helps highlight like dead ends and uh, places that aren't circulated well, um, as well as, um, you know, when, when, when you're doing your capital intervention planning, you get to, um, you know, propose certain interventions, right? Um, if you have a dead end main and you'd like to alleviate that, you might want to loop it. Where do you loop it? Is it sufficient? Like, these are the answers you can, or these are the questions you can answer using a calibrated model. Uh, you can, uh, you know, loop it in the model, see how it would respond uh, without building that capital investment. Same with upsizing or relining of any of these pipes. In the, uh, I guess, final deliverable of the water water model would be um, the, these the C factor um, and hydrant test maps are generated using the model network. They're, um, the, the C factors especially is, is a highly specific um, test that, 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 that's planned and executed to, to get a C factor of um, a specific pipe, right? Um, and, and generating these maps uh, and, and hydrant test configurations um, there, there's hundreds of these, um, and generating the maps to provide the condition assessment contractor is, uh, is an important part of putting together a condition assessment contract. And we use Python scripts for that. So uh, the, the DWSD all pipe sewer model is built in InfoWorks ICM. And like the, like the water model, how it's um, fully integrated with our GIS system, as the one source of its, you know, network, um, we we have something similar here. Jim Jim mentioned that uh, ICM is built on top of the Info Asset Manager uh, network. Um, all the all the network cleanup, QAQC, condition assessment, corrections that happens in Info Asset Manager. Um, in ICM, we 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 take all of that network cleanup. We we take that model. And then we add on top of it the regional collection system model, and and that's the um, that that's pretty much is the network and the controls for our um, our ICM model. Um, this is uh, I, I guess this is you know another uh, example of how Info Asset Manager like th this is what comes from Info Asset Manager our GIS in the regional uh, GLIWA model and how it all rolls up into the one all pipe sewer model. Now, 
because it's an all pipe sewer model, it's extremely um, it's extremely massive, right? To to model the storm flows uh, for for the duration of the storms and, and the complexity of these storms. Um, it, we what we needed to do was we needed to break out the model into uh, segments. So we logically uh, established ten sewer sheds, um, the, it, which so it was pretty much like you know uh, we broke out the city of Detroit into ten logical areas where we would model the regional system with the all pipe system attached to it, and you, you know. Um, so it, it would uh, it, it would essentially be a system model, but if, if you're performing uh, any calibration or capacity analysis in within that community, you would need to use um, you know the, the, this model. So you know we in doing that it, it runs much faster, and oftentimes you're not um, you know the the scenario running isn't a across the city uh, project that would require the entire um, system in, in, in a single model. So a lot of benefits to be had from breaking it up like this. Um, th th this illustrates the difference between the regional water wastewater collection system uh, maintained by GLIWA and the all pipe uh, sewer model. Um, regional model is great for evaluating uh, you know re regional uh, improvements, but it, it, if, if you want to understand what might be happening it within the neighborhoods um, or or anywhere you know else outside of the regional pipes um, you really do need to have this resolution that's provided by the ICM model um, in, in order to evaluate any lo local improvements upsizing lining or anything like that so and, and this just shows you how similar info asset manager and ICM are to um, capacity analysis. So, like like the water model, uh, we we maintain these models for a reason, right? And that is to um, pretty much get data out of it, right? Yeah. So we we spend the effort calibrating it, updating it, so that we can uh, model what what the how the system reacts to different storms, right? So we get to provide the model our design storms, um, of course, after calibration. And it will show us, you know, where we might have uh, surcharging, where we might have HGLs within critical limits. We use eight feet because, um, you know, that 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 is the depth of a Detroit basement. Um, you know, just a little bit above that, and then also to highlight areas where we we would have uh, a, a great amount of the capacity uh, called for. During dry weather flow conditions, um, the and, and the model can tell you so much more. But you know, these are a couple examples of what we. Uh, th these are criteria that's used in the risk and criticality model, and that might also be used in the um, planning interventions. Um, and again, you can run, uh, you can simulate interventions such as upsizing or the addition of relief sewers or lining projects with the model prior to um, actually constructing it. And I'll hand it back over to Jim. Thanks, thanks, Brian. So, in the transition from uh, SIPMO to DWSD, uh, that was a very a long process, which really started almost on day one. You know, where we identified uh, 22 diff different teams uh, for all the different disciplines within with with within the program. We identified objectives. We worked uh, very closely with DWSD staff on that developed a planning module for each team. We had multiple like monthly meetings with management, developed a resource calendar for where or where perhaps uh, additional staff needed to be to be hired and identified the skill sets needed. And we, we also had quarterly reports and transition meetings occurring with senior management on that stuff. So, and that's all been going very well. Now, next slide. Okay, so the status uh, at the end right now, uh, well, no, not the end, but we're, we're four years into this, um, actually more, four and a half. Um, all the standard operating procedures uh, that were identified initially are in place. Uh, in the Info Asset Manager database and methodologies have all been built. In the Info Asset Planner frameworks and decision trees are built. 
and are completely maintained right now by DWSD. The, the main water model and the all-main sewer model have been built and are operational. Um, InfoAsset Online has been tested by Brian and I and will be deployed next month. And the transition training has been completed for all software. And with that, I think we are ready for questions, Brian, are we? Hi, uh, yep. Perfect, thank you both. Um, that was awesome, super comprehensive and super uh, helpful, I think, for folks listening to see how you were able to manage all of these different systems uh, in order to, to do this work over four years, $400 million AP. That is no small uh, task, so thank you both um, for sharing your kind of journey there. Um, one of the questions that came in, Casey asked, uh, is water main lining being used more than open trench water main replacement? What types of lining materials uh, are being used? I think this was back in your section, Jim. Um, there. Okay, um, <clears throat> I don't know all the specifics of that. That's something the design group typically would get into, um, but uh, there are a number of options. I know the likes of in-situ form have various structural liners um you know the uh, other options uh, i think there's a you know uh, i think there's a i think it's called the tomahawk system has been explored to where um you know that that can pipes can be cleaned and then lined on the spot but i i, I will i will admit my my ignorance a little bit on those parts but our design group could uh, certainly get into more of the specifics on that on the water side Perfect, thanks. Uh, and of course we got the questions. Um, is this being recorded? Uh, yes, I think we will be able to uh, share the recording. And then yes, if you, if you would like a PDH, um, you should be able to get that, uh, just mention that in the survey at the end here. Um, one question I had is, is you're showing all the different parts. And again, there's four years, $400 million of CIP uh, work. All these systems kind of uh, came together with, I, I know you two. Uh, both experts and working on this system constantly, but what does the whole team look like? I think you kind of mentioned even on that second to last slide, 22 different teams, but about how many, what what groups, we get asked all the time, what groups do I need to do this? Like there are so many groups and people that come into, you know, when you're managing CCTV and databases, uh, what was that experience like uh, for both your perspectives, ACOM and then Detroit? Um, yeah. Okay. Brian, do you want to tackle it on the DWSD side? Yeah, so uh, I, I've transitioned about everything I know over to AECOM. Um, <laughs> wait, what? No, the transition was the other way. Um, yeah, so in, internally we have a, uh, in, in the sewer modeling team, we, we, we have uh, uh, two uh, engineers um, being transitioned to. And I think in, uh, in a number of the other areas, I guess we have uh, we have more. But um, I guess Jim, do you have anything? Sure. Um, I, I'd say all in all, of, I mean, I've been involved in the program, but uh, going on three and a half years now, and I, I'd say there have been roughly, very roughly maybe at least 30 or 35 people involved across various um, consultant side, you know, who come in and, you know, because we, we have subject matter experts that have a certain, you know, expertise in a certain area, they'll come in, help out with a certain part of it, and then, and then you know, move, move, move back out. And then with their guidance, then, you know, the rest of us that are working day in, day out on things will be, will be working um, based on, the, on that guidance. So it really depends, um, but um, but I, I'd say it's it's around it's around that number if that helps. Perfect. Yeah. Um, great. Well, I think Jim, you mentioned uh, folks might be able to catch this some of this work. You might be talking about this at um, further events potentially, or uh, yeah. I think we'll be sending out these slides or. Else right. Yeah. Um, I'll be presenting on very similar material, but of course not the same, um, at the uh, Water Jam Conference in, uh, I think it's Virginia Beach in September. And I think Brian's got one coming up as well. Yeah, April. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks again um, to you both. Uh, I know the interests were, were short, but uh, again, great to have two experts like yourself on here.
Uh, and uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. All right. Thanks for having us, Tim. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Right.